Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad you all are joining us. Come on into the Zoom room. All right, it's 6.01, so we are going, we are going to get started. Um, it's a pleasure to see everyone this, this evening. And uh, before we get started, I want to read the William and Mary's land acknowledgement and also the William and Mary's statement on slavery. William and Mary acknowledges the indigenous people who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Terenhaka Nataway, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mattapanai, Monacan, Nansman, Nataway, Pamunkey, Potomac, Upper Mattapanai, and Rappahannock tribes, and pay our respect to their tribal members past and present. William & Mary's statement on slavery and its legacies. The Board of Visitors acknowledges that William & Mary enslaved people, exploited them and their, and their labor, and perpetuated the legacies of racial discrimination. The Board profoundly regrets these activities, apologizes for them, expresses its deep appreciation for the contributions made by African, African and African American members of its community to the vitality of William and Mary then, now, and for all time coming, and commits to continue our efforts to remedy the lingering effects of past injustices. Again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Dr. Jawan Johnson, the Mellon Foundation um, Postdoctoral Fellow with the Lemon Project. I see a lot of familiar faces here. And I'm excited about this session that we are having tonight. Of course, as you know, this is the second installment of the series, um, Sankofa Genealogical, Summer Genealogical Research Series, got that kind of twisted up. But uh, through this series, we offer beginner and advanced level sessions on how to find your relatives, how to do community history research. Our last session was with Ms. Nika Sewell Smith, and it was absolutely dynamic, where we learned about three crucial records, Civil War pensions, the Freeman Bureau, and the probate and secession records. Um, and she did a dynamic job, and we encourage you to, to view that video. You can watch it on our YouTube channel. And also, um, we look forward to our August guest, Dr. Raquel Fileskis, um, who will be discussing DNA. And the theme of it is we carry, our DNA, we carry DNA of our ancestors, a genetic and genealogy workshop. And so we're excited about that upcoming work, workshop. But tonight, we have a wonderful guest with us, Ms. Besida Carthon White, who will talk about the importance of recognizing and sharing family treasures. And I'm gonna tell you a bit about her. Ms. Besida Carthon White has been a genealogist for more than 40 years. She is a family historian for nine families and manages DNA results for more than 40 persons. An independent community historian, she is the founder, co-founder of, and president of Middle Peninsula African American Genealogical and Historical Society. And she's also the founder of the Greater Richmond Ox Chapter, Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. White presented, uh, presents at numerous state, regional, and national uh, workshops. She does conferences. She teaches genealogy courses at Rappahannock Community College. Recently, she, was, she has managed several descendant projects, including the identification of the enslaved at Monokan, an 18th century property in Richmond, Virginia, and their present day descendants. White has directed the research and application processes for multiple state historical highway markers that reference African-Americans in Eastern Virginia, and presently um, has three markers at different stages of the application process, one that we talked about earlier that she may share. She's also the editor and co-editor of a Union Recipes, the White Family Cookbook, Help Yourself. There's a, mighty, there's a God Mighty Plenty, a treasury of recipes from Carthon and the Brooks family. And also she's a the publisher of Gather at the Welcome Table, the Angel Visit Baptist Church Sesquicentennial Cookbook. Without further ado, let's give our guest, Ms. Besida Carthon White, a virtual applause. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, Jawan and Sarah. Thank you for inviting me to at least virtually um, visit my alma mater this evening. And so I 
I appreciate that. I'll just say thank you for that gracious introduction. I am lucky enough to be a founder of Greater Richmond Ogs, along with uh, 25 or 30 other very, very um, invigorated genealogists. <laughs> so just wanted to, to say that. And thank you for inviting me to talk about family treasures. And some of you have heard me. I've been like a broken record uh, for the past, uh, I guess, almost a year now. And so what are family treasures, those objects that, um, in fact, I think the first thing I should do, though, is share my screen. I forgot that. Let's see if I can share my screen with you. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, all righty. So having done that, to talk about family treasures, those wonderful, wonderful things that give us such a sense of family history, community history, treasures that tell us about the lives of the persons who own them, their families, their communities, and society generally. Family treasures are highly valued, highly prized, based on memories and connections to people, places, and things. Some family treasures have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. Others may be newly acquired or even newly created. You may be creating family treasures even as we speak. They tell so many stories about our family experiences and give us such a richness and sense of family and community. And then you wonder, well, we're always saying, how much is this worth? Um, you know, I've, we've seen, uh, you know, Antiques Roadshow and similar programs. The value may not be monetary. Often it is not. Um, often it is just that it's valuable to your family and to your family history. Um, heirlooms and family treasures do a lot. They provide comfort. I know that as I am surrounded, and actually I live in my parents' home, and I'm surrounded by those things that surrounded them, and they provide comfort. Um, the family heirlooms help us to keep the stories alive, and we tell them again and again, tells us about our ancestors. And you know, those of us who are genealogists are so accustomed to uh, saying so-and-so was born on a certain date and they got married and they died on a certain date, but what were their lives like? So the treasures help us to put flesh on those bones of family history, uh, create all kinds of illustrations, tell us about the person's personality. And I found that um, you know sometimes as genealogists and family historians are talking, when we are talking to other family members, you see people's eyes glaze over. That oh wow, here she comes again. And so what we find is that family treasures can help to arouse the interest of those who previously may not have been at all interested in history. And we found that happened in my family, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. So what are family treasures? Almost anything. Anything that you can think about is a family treasure. Well, it is jewelry, furniture and housewares, clothing, other textiles, books, documents, photographs, of course, tools of the trade, tools, implements from your household and your kitchen, musical instruments, artwork and crafts, of course, medals and awards, ephemera, Anything at all that you value is a family treasure, absolutely anything. This is not something that I had given a lot of thought to until fairly recently. I guess I had instinctively collected things. And I think that that is um, something that um, I just knew to do because my parents did it and my grandparents did it, I've learned, but I hadn't thought a lot about it. I was holding on to items, cataloging them, but I hadn't given serious thought to intentionally using them to tell the stories. I had been using them, but not so much intentionally. And one of the things that happened, I always give credit, you know, I'm always stealing something from somebody else. I really am. And just 
unashamedly, I do, I do that. So the Baptist General Convention, and I see that uh, Dr. Dr. Burks is on, who is director of the Sacred Spaces Initiative for the BGC. And it, their Sacred Spaces has to do with the preservation of African-American churches, cemeteries, schools, et cetera. So actually, and they focused a lot on family history because they understand that you know family history, church history, community history, is all one. So at a program last October, Dr. Stephanie Wilkes, who is Dr. Burke's assistant, started to talk about these family treasures. And I thought, okay, I just really hadn't focused on it in that way before. And so as a result of what she was telling us and taught us in October, when we had our Genealogy Society meeting in December, and that's Middle Peninsula African American Genealogical and Historical Society, we invited people to come share. And so we had this wonderful sharing and three or four people, uh, including I see that uh, the Honorable Patricia Satterfield is on. She was one of those persons who shared her family heirlooms at that meeting. And then I went on to um, deal with my family, you know, as the pandemic has changed um, how we do things and made us pivot and do them differently, then my family has had what we call the white family Christmas dinner. We've had it every year, at least since 1955, maybe before nobody remembers. And of course we did it in person. In the past couple of years, you know, we had to do it virtually. So in 2020, we turned pandemic recipes into a mini cookbook that becomes a keepsake. Um, and of course we shared photographs. I mean, everybody shares photographs. And then in 2021 though, we asked family members to submit pictures and descriptions of their treasures, which we put into a PowerPoint and then turned into a digital pu publication that everyone could have. And of course, some people said, um, well, I don't have anything. You know, I, I don't have anything. And some people didn't submit because they thought they didn't have anything. But the response was overwhelming. Absolutely, everyone was engaged, even the very young. We heard folks who previously said they, they didn't have anything. Oh, I could have shared thus and so. So our plan is to continue with that effort. Um, and it's interesting that as I have collected things over the years, before I even knew necessarily that I was doing it, family members and persons in the community have placed objects in my care. And I won't say given them to me because I don't know that I necessarily own them, but I'm certainly the custodian for now of a lot of things that people know, okay, well, she will hold on to that. And so I appreciate that confidence. And recently, uh, several institutions have focused on treasures. The National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian started to focus on family treasures long before the museum opened. You know, Lonnie Bunch was on board years before the bricks and mortar building opened, and they held events around the country. They've got a panoply of resource documents, all of which are on the handout for this evening. So Joanna, are you gonna be putting the handout in the chat? And yes, thank you. Um, and then it's interestingly, just uh, last month for Juneteenth, the New York Times decided to focus on family, African-American family treasures. They asked photographers to submit items and to talk about them. And many said at first that nothing came to mind, but when they gave it thought, most realized that they had objects that told family stories. So I invite you to read that wonderful New York Times article and to review the many objects and the stories told about them. And that link is on your handout as well. So now I'm gonna share some of the things that I've collected and tell you a little bit about the stories that um, that we told or learned from them. And I hope that if I don't, uh, if I go on too long, then Joanne is charged with uh, giving me the signal that I'm talking too long. And so when we first started to talk in this household about family treasures uh, last, I guess, November, my husband went and brought out something. He said, well, is this something you want? And he brought me this pocket watch that he said had been given to him by his aunt, who is now about 95 years old. 
she gave it to him maybe 10, 15 years ago. And she told him that it belonged to his great-grandfather, um, who was born in 1864 in, um, I think, Timmonsville, Georgia, and died, migrated, part of the Great Migration, migrated north to Philadelphia, and died in Philadelphia in 1925. And so this may be one of the oldest things that we collectively as a household own. What was interesting is we looked it up, you know, the wonderful internet and Google, we learned that there is a um, several, what seem to be reputable sources on the internet for dating watches, especially Elgin watches. And so, you know, one of the first things was, well, is this watch old enough to have been owned by someone who died in 1925? And the answer is, yes, it is. This watch was made about 1888. We were able to learn that. And it's really interesting because it has, you'll see here, there's the clock, the watch face on one side, but on the other side, it opens and there's a space for, a, it's a locket or a photograph. And so it may be certainly one of our oldest items, but I, probably didn't even know that he had it until we started to have this conversation and be intentional about family treasures. The next one that I want to share, let's see, why is my, okay. This is um, my mo one of my most precious possessions. And what you see is a postal commission for my great grandfather who was appointed the postmaster at Dunsville in 1897. And it's interesting, that's in Essex County, you would think, well, maybe one he, he was one of the first blacks to be a postmaster. Well, actually, he wasn't. One of his cousins was a postmaster 30 years before. So in the late 1860s, we had a black postmaster in Essex County, believe it or not. But this is one of those things that was entrusted to me, and I have to be very grateful, by a great aunt who was actually the youngest child of Robert Henry Cawthorn. She gave it to me probably 30 or more years ago. And she had lots of great nieces and nephews she should she could have given it to and so i am appreciative it was in the frame that it probably was in for 100 years plus and so what i did is i i was i wanted to make sure it's preserved and so i actually talked to i think some people at the valentine museum and got the name of a conservator and took this and spent some hundreds of dollars to have it conserved. But I thought that it was important to do so. And once we had it out of the frame, then we were able to scan it, pictures of it. It's actually an image of it in the Essex County Museum. But that is truly one of my oldest um, possessions. And I'm going to have to decide the original is in this house, and that's not probably a good thing, you know, fairly temperature control, it's in an acid free box, but it eventually needs to go somewhere else. And so that is another thing as we talk about family treasures is where do they ultimately end up and what repository or with family or what have you. Um, but that's Robert Henry Cawthon and his, um, his postal commission. Um, this is interesting. Again, folks bring you stuff I'll just call it stuff. They bring you things, um, which is really great. So at one of our genealogy meetings, probably about two years ago, one of our members, David and Tal came up to me and she said, I have something for you. And she had this original invitation of to the Whalen Seminary graduation class of 1897. And she gave it to me because she knew that one of my great uncles was the class president. And so I had actually seen images of this and had a bad photocopy of it about 20 years ago, but this is actually an original. And so I've, um, and it helps me to tell his story. I mean, this is a man who started out in King and Queen County and ended up migrating to Nova Scotia and made an impact upon uh, Canada. In fact, there was a movie done uh, and it was about, actually not a movie, but uh, 
a segment uh, on the Canadian History Channel about immigrants who changed the fabric of life in Canada, and he was one of those. But this is a transcription so that we actually can see what that grad graduation invitation says. And the part of this man's story is that at Whalen, he was taught by a white woman from Nova Scotia, and she convinced him that things were much better for Negroes in Nova Scotia. So he would uh, go to Nova Scotia, she would help him. And he did, you know, Whalen was, was normal school. He did want to get a bachelor's degree. And so she convinced him that she would help him to get into her uh, alma mater, which was Acadia University, and help him to find some money because he didn't have any money. And so he took her up on that and became the second Black person to a graduate from Acadia. But then as we're trying to tell his story, and he's talked about a lot, I mean, and his is broadly known, but there's still parts of the story that we have wanted to uncover. So I was talking to Celicia Gregory Allen, who was the archivist at Virginia Union in Special Collections. And she said, I think we have a picture of the class of 1897. And so you'll see this is that class. This is the class president right here in the center. He stands out. We know what he looks like, lots of pictures of him. And so it just really helps to expand the story when we can see. And then again, uh, you know, doing this work is uh, such a cooperative kind of thing as folks help you do what you do. So one of my dear friends and colleagues and actually DNA cousin, we don't know how, Gloria Waller, who is co-founder of our genealogy society in Middle Peninsula, she was doing some research in the Temple University, um, Charles Bloxon collection. And she called me and she said, I found your relative's picture. And it shows you how everything is so connected and none of us in our family in Canada or in the US had ever seen this picture. But what Gloria was looking for was the, she was looking in the still papers. Okay, now William Still, the abolitionist, not the composer, <laughs> not that William Still, but William Still's uh, granddaughter, I guess, married um, one of Gloria's relatives. So that's why she's looking in the still papers, but this is what she found. Of course, the connection is that my um, double great grandmother, his mother married um, into the family that married into the still family. So all interconnected. So we're able to tell William Andrew White's story. And that's a phone in the distance that I didn't turn off. I'm sorry. It will stop ringing. Okay, so this is my great grandfather whose brother you just saw. And his name was George Granville White. And he was quite the artisan, quite the, um, he, he made things, he, he handled things. And so um, the bed that you see there is something that I own. And it's been in this house um, ever since I can remember. I always knew that it was George Granville White's bed. But what I did not know until last December, when we put out the call asking members of the White family to share those treasures, then one of my cousins said, I've got a chair that George Randall White made. And so we look at, isn't that just a beautiful work in that chair and how he must have dampened the wood to bend it and you know whatever the technical pieces of making that chair. But we were really, and we knew he was an artist on him and he was many things. Um, he was, some people may have called him the deputy for the colored in King and Queen County actually. And um, I was sharing with Javon and Sarah earlier that we just um, got preliminary approval for a highway marker for a lynching that took place in King and Queen County in 1923. Imagine my surprise in reading the transcript of the coroner's hearing to learn that this man, George Granville White, was on the coroner's jury for that, as were two other Black folk. But anyway, his story is rich, and seeing these objects helps us to tell that story. So. This is uh, another story that's probably not so positive, 
And my, as I said, my folks kept everything. So I found this, these receipts. And this first one is dated 1923. Joseph Smith, who was my grandmother's, my maternal grandmother's brother, has paid on a note. And then we see this um, statement from the Middlesex County Circuit Court that um, details his account. And so I was fascinated what went on with Uncle Joe. And by the way, this photograph was black and white. And I colorized it on my heritage. And so my heritage uh, does a good job in much of the time with uh, colorization. So the story on Joseph Henry Smith is that he started to buy property. He was from King and Queen, Lower King and Queen, started to buy property in King and Queen and in Middlesex in 1917, bought property, um, needed to make more money to pay for it. So he went north in that great migration to, you know, to work as what we used to say in the vernacular, work in private family. That's what they, that was the terminology used for black folk going to work in white folks homes, largely in the north. So he went to work in private family to be able to pay for his property. And so I have dozens of receipts. So I wanted to tell his story. And actually, I was able to incorporate his story as the local component of an exhibition. Uh, the Schomburg was doing an exhibition called In Motion, the African American Migration Experience. And when that was it became a traveling exhibition, we actually had it at the Black History Museum in Richmond. And what we wanted to do was to add a local or add a Virginia component. So I was able to tell Joseph Henry Smith's story, which is in many ways a sad one. He actually paid for the property, you know, working in white folks' homes, he paid for the property early. And then, you know, everything was hunky dory. Then he became ill with tuberculosis. He had to borrow money on the property. He was very ill. He died. And then eventually the property was foreclosed upon. And so we were able to tell that whole story and have it be a part of the exhibition. And so he was truly reaching for the American, for the North, for the American dream. But that's Joseph Henry Smith's story, my grandmother's brother. Um, and this is my grandmother. Ida Smith Cawthon, um, born in King and Queen County in 1884. I actually graduated from Virginia State Normal and Industrial Institute. They had removed the collegiate by then in 1905. And I found this, I didn't have a chance to talk to my mother about it, but I found this medallion. And it says it's gold, apparently. I haven't had it tested, but it looks like it's gold, probably 10 carat. And it says Ida S. Cawthorn on one side. And on the other side, it says WDBMC 1916 to 1942. Now, fortunately, I knew what that was. I didn't have to do any research because I knew that one of the uh, allied bodies of the Southside Rappahannock Baptist Association called in the vernacular the association uh, without the ASS part. Uh, but I knew that the Women's Baptist, Women's District Baptist Missionary Convention, uh, that that's what that was. And she was its treasurer from 1916 to 1942. In fact, at, and I kind of sort of remembered hearing that she was an officer in that. Of course, before my time, I didn't you know, actually remember it. But I found the minutes of the meeting where she was elected. I found those minutes at the Virginia Baptist Historical Society. So the white Baptist um, had actually had those records of the Black Baptist. So I found that um, the minutes of where she was elected. And then in the SRBA minutes, I found actually 1943 where she got the award. And so I was able to tell her story and her story is a rich one. So this, I told you, they kept everything. This is her 1937-38 contract with King William County School Board so she, and to teach. So she was being paid $47.50 a month for a term of eight months. But 
teacher shall be held responsible for the sanitary condition of all school buildings and grounds at all times during school term. So she was hired not only to be the teacher, but to be the janitor as well. And so that helps me to tell her story and helps it to come alive. And of course, she was one of the final teachers at the Rappahannock Industrial Academy, which was one of the Negro academies that operated from 1902 to 1948. And she was in the final group of teachers. So this is her husband, my maternal grandfather. And this picture is, I've seen it around my whole life. And the story is that now this man lived in Essex County at Ozena in Essex County his entire life. And so the story is that when he is 19, he got the steamship, which is how you travel to Baltimore, you know, from, I don't know whether he took, went from Bowler's Wharf or Ware's Wharf, but he got the steamship. And it's interesting. I used to think, okay, well, you could go straight to Baltimore. Well, no, you can't go straight north because you got to go, I mean, the Rappahannock River uh, doesn't get you to Baltimore, right? So you got to go south down to the mouth of the bay, up the bay to Baltimore. But anyway, so he went to Baltimore, as the story goes. And at 19, he had this picture taken. Purportedly, as a photographer gave him this cut glass punch bowl. Now, I'm not sure why a photographer gives you a punch bowl, but that is, and so we have the punch bowl. I mean, it's right on the sideboard just across the room from me, but it helps me to tell James Webb Cawthorn's story. And that's his father, who was the postmaster at Dunsville. So then I moved back to talk about some of my Canadian family. So these are siblings. Um, and these are two of the 13 children of the gentleman that you saw who migrated to Canada and who did all kinds of things. The first person to have a radio ministry in Canada. Apparently when he died, the streets of Halifax, there were hundreds of people out. But anyway, these are two of his 13 children. So Bill White, um, his son, and you see this is, um, he's the third because my double great grandfather was named William Andrew White the son who went to Canada, and this is the third one. So uh, born about 1950, uh, born in 1915, died in 1981. Um, Bill was a composer, you know, lots of music in this family. Of course, it, that music gene skipped over me, well, at least the ability to sing. But anyway, I enjoy that that the others produced. Um, so in social justice activist, was the first black person in Canada to run for national office, which he did in 1947. His sister Portia was a famed contralto. We often compare Portia's statue in Canada to Marian Anderson's in the United States. And you see an image of the postal stamp uh, that the Canadian government issued for Portia White. And I have a first run of that stamp as a collectible, of course. And of course, we've used the stamp We've made tree ornaments out of the stamp. We've used the image of that stamp for all kinds of things so we could move them around the family. And so these are siblings. And this is actually one of our stateside cousins actually attended Portia White's town hall recital in December of 1945 and held on to the program. And this was, wasn't Portia's, we at first thought it was her town hall debut, but actually her debut at town hall was 1944. And this was, um, actually she had performed, I think this may have been her third time there. So she was very, very popular in, in New York. And so these are very special to me. Now, one of the things that we've, or we're doing, of course, we've not had reunions in person because of the pandemic, is at our family reunions, we have an auction to raise money for the family treasury. And what folks have started to do is to bring things for auction that are family collectibles. And so what you're doing is you're spreading the collectibles around and allowing someone else to have an opportunity and plus they're paying for it. So you are enhancing the treasury. So Bill White 
as you've heard about, was multi-talented and he did needlepoint. And so Portia, unfortunately, his sister died young. She died in 1968 of cancer. So there were all these wonderful ball gowns that Portia performed on the concert and opera stage. And so Bill did these pillows, needlepoint on one side, and then fabric on the other side that was a fabric from Portia's gown. And so the first one at the top is a blue velvet gown. Of course, he's matched his needlepoint to it. And the um, second one is a gold satin pot de soie. And so very collectible. I have them because I bought them from Sheila White, um, who is um, one of Bill's daughters at the auction at the White family reunion. Um, and the same for this silver plated bowl. This belonged to Portia and uh, Sheila has lots of things that belong to Portia. And so she wanted to move them around. So I paid dearly for it at the White Family Reunion auction. So moving just a little bit to tell another kind of, of story. This is a diploma from Virginia State High School, which was located on the campus of Virginia State College for Negroes was the name of the school at that time in 1930. And the reason, and this helps us to fill in the story, the reason there was a high school on the campus is because many of the high schools for Black folk across the state were not accredited. So what that meant is when you graduated, then you couldn't go on to college. You had to um, do some more study. And so this is um, an image of the Virginia State High School diploma for my aunt-in-law, Florentine Melanie Jordan White. And so she graduated from the previously mentioned Rappahannock Industrial Academy, it was not accredited. And those, she went on to Virginia State. So she spent five years at Virginia State, the one year, you know, the additional high school year, and then four years of college. Now, interesting, my mother always told the story. She had to do that same thing. And so that extra year of high school at Virginia State High School, she took three sciences, hard sciences, biology, chemistry, and physics, because her high school had no labs. And so that's what she was forced to do. Uh, so they did that at Virginia State High School. My father, on the other hand, um, his family was able to send him elsewhere. So once he graduated from our academy, then he went on to Fine Institute, an African, obviously African-American boarding school, high school in Chase City, Virginia, that was totally and thoroughly accredited. So he and his brother, graduated their second high school graduation from Thine Institute. And I have this document. It's still, I actually took this picture of it in the frame and I need to take it and have a conservator um, work on it, but helps us to tell the story of all the kinds of things black folk had to go through and that they were able to triumph. So um, this is my mother. And this is, I'm so fortunate to have this invitation to her 1933 graduation from Virginia State College for Negroes. I think that the reason I have it is that a cousin who had received it apparently gave it back to my mother maybe 30 or 40 years later because it was in an envelope from that person. So that person held on to it and apparently she didn't keep well, one, didn't survive in her possession. But this is the, um, and so this is the actual commencement program from that commencement. And so I'm so fortunate to have all of those kinds of things to be able to tell her story. Um, of course, as her five years at Virginia State, one in high school, and then four years of, of college. And then a part of her story, uh, we like to talk about, but you don't have time tonight, the Gene Supervisor Program. And she was one of those supervisors of Negro education in a couple of counties in the Middle Peninsula, Matthews and Middlesex counties. And so that's a part of her story, but seeing these things helps to tell that story. And so this, and I'm gonna to try to move quickly here. Uh, this is my paternal grandfather, Lobentree White. 
And he was a teacher in a one-room school, in fact, two one-room schools in King and Queen County, Paces School and Bunker Hill School. And this bell is said to be the bell that he used to signal when class was to start, when recess was to end, that kind of thing. And we've always known that this was his bell. It's on the mantle behind where I sit right now. However, last December, when we were asking family members to share these things, somebody else came up with a bell. They said, this is Lil Bentrigue's bell. So um, I think he must have had to. And actually, I had this bell worked on because the, um, the ringer, whatever you call it, was, was coming off. But anyway, um, it's Lil Bentrigue's bell. And so sometimes the things that help you to tell the stories are not necessarily things that you have. They may be public records that help you tell the story. So this is his World War I draft registration card, my grandfather. I was totally shocked to see that he was working as a farmhand in South Jersey, in Salem, New Jersey. So what that means is he's left King and Queen County. He's a widower with two children. I don't think he's gone to college yet, or um, let's see, I have to see what time of the year this was. I don't see that just now, or yeah, it's June. So maybe he was in college and was going to South Jersey to earn that money in the summertime. Uh, but I had not known that he had gone and eventually you know, he graduated from Virginia Union. He became a preacher. Um, he was a school teacher, but I never knew that he would worked as a farm hand. But, and of course we see his signature on here. And then I get his handwriting again. I've got this wonderful notebook of his sermons. And so what I've got, to, and it's huge, this is just, you know, a couple of pages. So they need to be transcribed. They're very fragile. You know, I don't touch them other than with gloves because he died in 1935. Um, and so just a wonderful, I need to transcribe. And so I've, I've got much work to do, but it certainly helps to tell his story. And I've not really read much of these. And so I'll learn more about him when I read what his messages were. And so um, another relative, we're gonna move quickly here. Um, this is J. Harold Montag, who was a conductor, composer, professor of music. He was my first cousin once removed, my father's uh, maternal first cousin. And um, he created the uh, music department at South Carolina State he, in the late 20s. He then moved on to Virginia State, created the music department, developed the acapella choir, arranged all kinds of spirituals. And I'm so fortunate, like I said, people will give you stuff. I was given this sheet music by Johnella Edmonds, who was director of the Virginia State Choir at the time. And this is Let Us Break Bread Together, arranged by J. Harold Montag. And it's interesting that the copyright date is 1950. You see that, the, the Roman numerals on there. And so he died in 1950. And so it's interesting that this was copyrighted the year he died. And this is J. Harold Montag with the Virginia State College a cappella Choir in 1933, which is, I believe, the year that he came to Virginia State. Okay, this is my father, Randolph Kyler White, who you'll see was ever, he created, he worked in every medium, we didn't know he was an artist. We knew he made things, but he would never have called himself an artist. And only as we have um, collected and analyzed have we realized that he was an artist. So this is a chair that he told us he made in grade school. He actually did the weaving of the seat. And so uh, he was born in 1912. This probably would have been in the early 1920s. The chair is here in this house. It's a little rickety, you know, we don't let even, we tell the cat not to even jump on it because, you know, we want it to, we want to keep it. Uh, so we probably need to have a conservator look at it. Um, but these are things he made. He made things with found items. And so one of the things about treasures, and we'll talk about this later, is tell your young people what they are and what the provenance is. 
my daughter did not know, and, and she's very, very into family history and into objects, but she did not know that my father, her grandfather created this dog sculpture from a piece of found wood until we started to talk about this last fall. And she did not know that he made the lamp that you see from a piece of wood of which a vine had wrapped around the wood to create that pattern. And so I was texting her today and I said, are you telling me that you did not know that that was a dog? She said, no, I didn't. I said, and you did not know that Randolph made it? No and no. <laughs> so she didn't know any of that. And so the value, and that's interesting. And one of my little cousins who is, you know, younger than my daughter, he knew that that was dog. He said he used to try to pluck the eyes out because of course my father has set little jewels in that are the eyes of the dog and so on. Um, and this is something he made. This was for a project. My daughter was in the sixth grade and she needed this um, object that was uh, reindeer like those made in Finland. So he made her the exact reindeer and she has it. And then finally to talk about Randolph and it helps us to show him ever the entrepreneur. So he was in the army during World War II, was stationed in the Pacific. Um, Fuji, Guam, places like that. And so he wanted to make money. He made objects and sold them. And so this is one that he did not sell. It's a bracelet that he made. My daughter now owns it. And I did not know until last year, my husband told me, he said, it's metal from a down Japanese fighter plane. I thought, really? You know, I didn't talk to my father about military because I wasn't interested in military. So that probably was an error on my part, but thank goodness somebody in the family knew. And so that's just a part of, um, how are we coming, Juwan? Got a few more minutes, do we? Yes, we have a few more minutes. Few more minutes. And then I'll, I'll go quickly. Open up for questions and answers. Yeah, so people give you things I had and, and realize that you will take, you will keep them. So I had a cousin who called me and she is closing out and selling the home that she lives in, that her parents lived in, and when they were they moved into it when they were married in 1918. And so as I go and sit with her, I was there like seven hours, and we look through all these papers, papers. So what do I find but my parents' wedding announcement? This cousin, the mother of the cousin I'm visiting with, who's about 90 years old. Her mother has kept this invitation. And so, I, of course, I recognize the writing on the envelope is my grandmother's handwriting. They got married on a Sunday, April 12, 1942. They must have had the invitations. I'm sure she was organizing not the invitations, but the announcements. They must have been ready to be mailed because it's postmarked the next day in Tappahannock. And so I was just so delighted to have this, and I, you know, I, I took a picture of it with my phone from deep in the middle of all these documents, and I sent it to my daughter without a comment. And I said to the cousin, I said, the phone's gonna be ringing in a minute. And she was screaming, just delighted that we had been given this wonderful, wonderful document. And this, of course, is that wedding. We had the pictures of the wedding with all the family members that took place in the home and um, you know World War II, very conservative, the bride's wearing a navy blue suit and her parents, her grandfather and so on. But we have those photographs as well. And this is something really special to me. Uh, I had an aunt with whom I was very close and as she was near the end of her life, you know, we'd have big birthday parties for her. We had a surprise birthday party for 79, a surprise birthday party for 80. For 81, um, I just went to see her in the nursing home. And for her birthday, she gave me a gift. She took this ring off her finger. And it's just really interesting because all of those bands that you see are individual bands. And then of course, it's the Pave Diamond face on there. Uh, but that's just so special to me because she gave it to me for her 81st birthday. And then uh, I have an uncle who was a barber. So this is when we ask for um, family 
heirlooms and to tell family stories. This is him. That's him off to the left in the barbershop. This is his last license, 19, uh, 2000, expired in 2003. And these are some of the tools of his trade that his daughter has kept to pass on. Of course, I don't know how long that powder will last before it. I don't know whether it rots or deteriorates or does something. But anyway, she's got that to pass on to her children. And this is something I just put in today. I wanted to share with you. You know, my mother was, uh, we found out after she died that she was a griot in every Afri every sense of the African word. She told the stories over and over again. When you've heard something the 25th time, you will remember it. And, but yet she also maintained some of the old ways, some of the home remedies. So this is in her handwriting, the instructions for how to make a mustard plaster. And you say, what is that? A mustard plaster is something that you make of egg white and flour and dry mustard. And you, uh, you put it on your chest and it breaks up the congestion. But there's apparently some uh, chemical reaction that happens because you better not fall asleep with that mustard plaster on your chest because it will burn your skin. But at any rate, that's um, in her handwriting, her instructions for mustard plaster, very specific. She tells you to take a piece of an old, a six, a eight by 16 inch piece of cloth, a piece of an old sheet works well, she says, uh, if she's being, you know, using what she had. And then this is it typed as we were planning to, um, we were planning to put this recipe in a home remedy section of a family cookbook, one of the many cookbooks we did, but I think the home remedy section never happened. So this is something that I've um, just getting to the end here. Um, this is my father and my father's one of nine children that grew to adulthood. So the photograph you see is all uh, nine of them with their mother slash stepmother and her husband. And you see my mother is holding, I keep going to see her holding this handbag here. And so the date is August 1970. I have that handbag. This is a photograph of it I took on yesterday. It is patent leather with the bone handle. And I've actually had a conservator um, do whatever they do to keep the leather soft and, and pliable, but um, something that I hold on to dearly. And this is something I just pulled as we talk about ephemera and those things that were um, made not to last long, like theater tickets and posters. So my husband, the actor, this is a poster and that's him that you see right here as King Creon about 1966, at a Virginia State College Theater Guild production of Medea. And so we have got that framed, I think, and it's, you know, pieces chipped off of it. You see, it wasn't preserved over the years, but it does, it is a collectible. And we're, and I think somewhere we've got something uh, of him and waiting for Godot. So he was ever, ever the actor. And this is something really different. And I don't know if you've ever seen before. This is a keychain charm carved from a peach pit. So this one that you actually see was carved by a first cousin once removed of mine, who's probably about 25 to 30 years old. But he learned how to do this from his grandfather, who just turned 90 years old, who learned it from his grandfather, who is the one whose bed and chair you saw. And so this has been passed on. I mean, it's who, who carves a peach pit, you know? The white family carves peach pits. I'm not quite sure why, but that's what this is. And I don't have one of these. So I've charged my uncle and my cousin with, you got to make me one because I don't own one. Um, and then very quickly, two mysteries. Sometimes um, these treasures pr promote mysteries. So Alfred Fraser White, one of my great uncles, actually graduated from Lincoln, the Pennsylvania Lincoln University, um, I guess in 1916 or so. He then went on to Harvard Law School. He was on the de debate team at Lincoln. He was on the debate team at Harvard. So in our family's possession 
there is this Yale University debate key. And what had been said by, as people were passing it on and didn't read, they said is Frazier's key from Harvard. Well, it's not his key from Harvard because it says Yale, okay? And it's a winning team and actually says on the back 1911 to 1919. I don't know why the winning team was, why the time, the range is such a long time, but I don't know what the story is on this. Why do we have it? It must have been Frazier who was, he would have been only one in our family, even slightly close to an Ivy League debate key. So we're still trying to figure that out. Another um, mystery, this dish, which is um, Haviland, Limoges, Haviland, China, was inherited by my daughter. And it's supposed to have belonged to the grandmother in Richmond, okay? Now we're talking about a King and Queen County family. Who is the grandmother in Richmond? Unfortunately, I never ask anybody who could have answered that, but it must have been the mother of someone born in 1837, which I doubt, or the mother of that person's wife who was born about 1850. So what I look to see is whether this pattern was made that long ago that it was probably owned by somebody who did most of what they were doing in the late 19th century. And it turns out that you go by the mark, the back mark. And so the back mark, which you see pictured here, is consistent with it being that old. Now, we still haven't figured out the grandmother in Richmond, who was she? Uh, whether this was in fact her item, but that's what we have. So um, in conclusion, so this is a photograph, you know, as we pivot and do things differently uh, during the pandemic. And so this is uh, the kind of picture that we catalog and keep. And this is our family at our virtual Christmas dinner last December when we shared all those treasures and all those treasures at least. And so we start to see heirlooms through a new lens. Let's hope we can really document all these objects and the stories that they tell and then be intentional about it because that's what I was not intentional until recently. And so I invite you to be intentional so that those items can be preserved. So you wanna identify and locate them. You write, wanna write down everything that you know about them or have heard about them, even if you don't know whether it is true, but write down the, and pass on the oral history. Tell your family members, especially the young ones. And then, you know, some people may say, well, I don't really have anything. You know, I was adopted, I was in foster care will collect and create your own treasures. And I see that that word is misspelled. It's not treasurers, it's treasures. Um, so create your own because think about what kinds of things that you wish you had from your ancestor 80 or 100 years ago. So create and preserve those things today. And then make sure you care for your treasures appropriately. And I've not gone into that, but it's in the handout. There's lots of material out there on how to care for things. And of course, the enemy of most things is humidity and sunlight and critters. Uh, so, but in your handout is all that information on how to care for your precious treasures. So in the handout also, all of these documents from the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, and these and other resources are on the session handout. So I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you so much, Masada, for that wonderful presentation. Um, if you would give her a round of applause virtually, feel free to use your reactions. And we, uh, we're gonna take about five minutes um, for questions. So if you have questions, feel free to place them in the chat. I think we have a comment here from Karen. So the more formal association of Ivy League debaters began 
in 1908 when Harvard, Princeton, and Yale agreed to hold three annual debates known together as triangulars. Debaters at each college fiercely competed before their faculty members for the coveted slots. So instead of debating uh, one person on one person, it was three people um, debating at one time. Mm. So that might be what the key rings from. But interesting about it, I just noticed today that it says inter, let's see, what was that language? I have to look back. It, it, it's interdepartment is what it says. So it made me wonder whether that was competition between different departments at Harvard, because it does say interdepartment debate. So thank you for that information. We'll have to uh, look to see. Um, what we can learn about the key. Okay. And again, I have placed the handout in the chat. I'm gonna place it there again for everyone. Well, if we have no questions, again, thank you all for joining us. Is there anything um, that you would like to add in closing, Basada? Um. The only thing I would say is please, please preserve your items. Uh, think about them and, and read that New York Times article because you will be inspired by that as well. Um, to just think about all kinds of things that you may not have thought about the stories behind them. Um, so, you know, everybody has things, um, even if you are not thinking that you do, but you do. And so, identify them and by all means tell your young people write down the provenance and what they are and it may be that you don't know the entire provenance you only know what you know and so all you can say is well you know or history says thus and so or this is how i met this item oh, but i encourage all of you thank you so much again you all have a wonderful evening um, definitely check out our social media platform, um, information on our upcoming workshop to be held in August. Feel free to register for that. Also, um, continue to, to follow us via our newsletter that we send out. Um, again, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation again, Besida, and thank you all for joining us. Have a good night. <laughs>